Hello, everyone. This is Nairi from Low Carbon Fasting. Well, who am I hosting today? I'm hosting two wonderful ladies uh, that I'm um, honored to call friends. They are uh, uh, they are inspiring people with their efforts in this space to spread the message of good health to all. Their fellow podcast hosts, Jackie Fletcher in red from the UK, <laughs> and Maggie Stewart uh, from the US. Um, Jackie and Maggie, welcome to Low Carbon Fasting. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Um, so Jackie, you are the host of the fabulously keto podcast. Yep. And Maggie is the host of Off of the Couch podcast. <laughs> Maggie, I'm really fascinated to know where that name came from, off of the couch. I mean, it's kind of self-explanatory, but let's hear your story. Gosh, you know, I'm not sure I remember. Um, I've had the name for a long time. I wrote, I actually wrote a little Kindle book, um, I think about 2014, and it's still there. Um, I need to update it. Because, you know, we've all learned new things and it's probably, probably some things are wrong in it. But um, gosh, I'm not really sure. I just came up with it and stuck with it. Off of the couch. I love it. I love it. It says it all right. Off of the couch. Do something about your health. I think it gives empowerment to people. There's an empowering sort of message in there. Get off the couch and take charge of your health. <laughs> I love it. I love the name. And of course, fabulously keto. You can't go wrong with that either. <laughs> Where did that come from, Jackie? So it was because I did keto and I felt fabulous. So that's how it came about. <laughs> now, over the years, it's it's sort of broadened the spectrum to be now real, real food, low carb, primal, keto, carnivore, fasting, encompass every, everything really. And lifestyle changes as well as diet. So um, it's sort of grown and adapted over the years, but the name has stuck. Well, I think we've all we've all adapted a little bit and learned more, as Maggie was saying, over the years, because I also started off writing a book. Mine is almost ready, not published, Maggie. Oh, yeah. Not published. But then I gave up on it. And recently I was having a look at my father. I thought, oh, gosh, no, that sentence is just too confident in there we still don't really know that and you know again it needs updating um so um jackie you have a you have a personal story tell us yeah about so um i mine goes back way back decades back to when i was a child so my um my grandfather was obese my dad was obese and i grew up believing that i take after them um, I grew up believing that that will be my destiny too. And I was always, I was bigger than all the other kids. I, you know, I probably wasn't fat, but I was bigger than all the other kids. So I felt fat. Um, and so this led to low confidence. By the time I was 12 or 13, I was started dieting, Weight Watchers, S later on Slimming World, I don't know the names of the diets that I tried, but I could never stick to it. I would do it for a few weeks and then I think, oh, I won't do it at the weekend. And I never got back to it. And and so over time, I just thought I can't I can't do it. I can't diet. And then I told myself diets don't work. But going back again till I was uh, 17, I had a tumor on my ovaries, which was the size of a UK soccer ball. Um, and they took that out along with one and a half ovaries, which I didn't find out until I was in my 40s um, and my appendix. So that massive operation um, 10 days before I was 18. And that, I, as I learned later on, had a massive knock on effect on my hormones. Um, I ballooned in weight. I went up to 90 kilos, which is about 200 pounds, something like that um by the time I was 19 and and so my genetics along with the way my family ate along with hormones um you know I was just overweight all the time 
I did slim down a bit, a little bit after that. And uh, was probably when I was in my 20s, I was probably the same weight I am now. But then in my late 20s, I started to get migraines, really severe migraines. Um, they told me there's this new drug out that you can take and it really helps. Except they may, over time, I realize now it was probably just rebound effect of making it worse. So I was having loads of headaches all the time, sort of every other day taking loads of pills um and so and i didn't realize i couldn't get pregnant because i'd had one and a half ovaries removed surprise surprise it was hard work um i ended up having ivf and had twins when i was 40 and three weeks later i had a gallbladder attack um which i didn't know what it was i was just in excruciating pain um and so I dealt with that on and off for many years. Um, and then I came and so, and I'd grown up with, I'd, by the time I got to my thirties, it was diets don't work, you know, don't bother with diets, diets don't work. I know what I've got to do. I've got to eat less and move more. That's the answer. You know, we're told that it makes absolute sense. Eat less and move more, except I couldn't eat less and I wouldn't move more. So it, it didn't work. And every night I'd go to bed and I'd say, tomorrow's going to be different. Tomorrow I'm going to eat less and I'm going to move more. And every day I'd wake up and I didn't eat less and I didn't move more. So nothing changed until I came across Gary Taubes' book, Why We Get Fat. And, and at that point, I wasn't going to diet because I know diets don't work. I have no motivation. I am don't have any willpower. And this permeated out into all areas of my life um but i read the book anyway and it sort of made sense and i just started cutting stuff out and here we are seven years later four stone 25 kilos 56 pounds down and never put it back on again i put on about half a stone here and there go up come down go up come down but never gone back to my original weight so that's my story really well, what a wonderful story. Uh, um, Jackie, I really, it's fascinating to hear um, uh, that it was Gary Tobbs who, um, you know, motivated you. And that's, I hear his name so many times on this channel. Yeah. Even Dr. Filippo Vedia that we probably, uh, uh, both of us know, uh, or all well, well, three of us know, he said to me that he was inspired into metabolic health because of Gary Top. So um, I'm hoping to bring him on as well to discuss oh, great. his uh, the, uh, book on diabetes, the recent one, but I haven't finished the book, actually. Yeah, I've been trying to get one. Gary on for years, but I never get a response. And I've even uh, had an intro. I've even had an intro to him and still no response. Well, he was he was busy with his book. So I think I'll... Uh, yeah. I'm hoping to finish well. I don't know when I will. It's a large, it's a massive volume. So oh. it, it's not one of those that you can read. It's not like his, I mean, his other books are also sort of quite deep, but this one is, I think, the deepest of them all. And it's not an easy to read book. However, he's inspired us all. Maggie, yeah. what's your personal story? Yeah, my personal story is more about... Um fitness and strength training I um was not overweight and I but I uh, decided to go into forestry for um when I had to come up with a career choice and I transferred to a university that had a forestry program and it was mostly men in those days and I felt a little bit like I had to try to keep up it was the uh uh, I went to college in the late 70s and I wanted to um, take advantage of, you know, women getting into this new field, but not feel like I couldn't keep up. So I um, I think it was about like up to about 1977, 78, it was kind of looked on as um, something that wasn't done for women to do weight training, at least where I lived. 
And then um, around the late seventies, they started putting in these really nice Nautilus studios and they were co-ed and, you know, as women, we would go in in like a little goofy looking leotard and some leg warmers. I don't know why we wore that, <laughs> but it was the style at the time. And I learned how to do that routine. And in, I got a job with the forest service. And the first year I was in a very active, um, part of the forest service where we were out in the woods and we were um, physically fit in case they wanted to call us to go on a firefighting, this kind of thing. But then the next year I got a job in the main office, which wasn't even out in the woods. It was down in the San Joaquin Valley in California. And I found it terrible because I wanted to be out where the action was with my new friends. But um so I was with more of an administration kind of office and luckily in the town was a Nautilus gym. So I kind of consoled myself by going to the gym <laughs> and then it just kind of turned out every few years, you know, when I really needed to get in shape, I could find these Nautilus gyms. They had kind of popped up around the country and I learned and I, I just never had to diet. If I started getting weight, I would just kind of uh, try to eat well and exercise and it included strength training and I think that was very unusual for most women just something I fell into and so then fast forward to uh, when I'm 40 I wanted to become a personal trainer my brother-in-law had been a personal trainer and kind of encouraged me and so I um took the tests and everything and I, but I didn't have a lot of hands-on experience as a trainer. So I volunteered at my local YMCA and they trained me to, um, through the Nautilus machines and to help people learn how to do it. And I got a lot of experience taking people through Nautilus machines and also the cardio machines. You know, they would, at the time you would do the strength training at the time they did it three times a week. I think now we tell people twice a week, we've changed that a little bit. And then, um, to pick a cardio machine, whether it's an exercise bike, a treadmill or elliptical, something like that and do that. Uh, like 20 minutes, three times a week. So those were the instructions. And I really enjoyed teaching people. And I, um, I noticed that a lot of people hate to exercise. And I think that's because they, um, you know, make that big plan on New Year's. They're going to do an hour of cardio every day. <laughs> And it doesn't work and they reduce their calories uh, to like an unrealistic amount. And, you know, within a month or two, they feel terrible and they stop. So, um, so I just felt like the small amount consistently is just a really wonderful thing to do. It's not really that difficult. You, if you can't get to a gym, there's things you can do at home and really, a, you know, very short amount of time and and it has huge benefits mental health benefits psychological benefits as well as um weight loss and you know or keeping your weight um where you want it and then also now we've been finding out that it's even good for the immune system all the stuff about the myokines and and it helps prevent dementia and then as you get older too, you really realize it's not just about looking good in your bathing suit or your, your new outfit. It's also about going into old age and being able to retire and still do really fun activities, really fun things, and be able to take care of yourself as long as possible. That's wonderful. Um, when you were uh, talking about the 1970s, <laughs> gym fashion the gym trends it just reminded yeah, me leg jane warmers fonda. leg warmers jane fonda jane fonda <laughs> had videos like that didn't she? yes um yeah i had leg warmers but they never looked good on me because i was always <laughs> overweight <laughs> well i actually wore leg leg warmers in the 80s yeah the in the 80s not in the, gym, yeah. not in the gym um so uh oh yeah just a couple of days ago i was uh scrolling on um 
watching the reels on, on Instagram. And there was this gym scene from the 1960s in the, in the oh, US. Uh, well, no, I think it was the UK, um, uh, Jackie. And it was just females in mini skirts. Of course, that's the, that was the times, right? The mini, mini, <laughs> mini skirts. Um, and they were wearing heels. And I just had a good laugh. They were actually wearing heels and they were waiting lifts, etc. So, okay. <laughs> They were in heels. I'll share that with you. And I was I couldn't believe it. Anyway, um, okay. So, uh, Jackie, back to you. Uh, I didn't know about your cancer story. So, where are you with it now? That was when you were eighteen. So, obviously, decades have passed now. But where are you with it now? I um. So, from when I was eighteen, I had um tests every year. Um. Well, I went to see the um gynecologist every year until probably my mid 40s when um so my gynecologist had retired he passed me to his registrar who was there when I had the operation and when he retired I just sort of didn't go anymore um I don't worry about it I don't think about it I I mean it was benign they say it was benign my sister thing seems to think that it wasn't I don't know um I don't have any tests I believe that if you look for things, you will find them. Um, so I don't look. I feel well. I feel he healthy. I don't have any symptoms. And so on I go. And I I don't test for anything. Um, I avoid the doctors like the plague if I can. Um, and, yeah, I just look after myself. Yeah, I think uh, I hear that message all the time. I mean, I'm the same. And it shouldn't be like that. We should really work in partnership with our medical medical care teams. Oh, it's type 1 di diabetic. I could do with the support. Oh, yeah. They just don't understand what I'm doing. <laughs> they just okay. don't understand. Nor are they receptive, uh, you know, to learning. Or, or mm. they don't even show cu curiosity. So, yeah. So um... I've, got, I've got an issue at the moment, which is my ferritin levels are very high and they have been for a few years. So they have referred me to a hematologist. I am going to listen because it's a phone consultation. So I will listen to what he has to say. But chances are I won't. I don't, I don't know <laughs> what I'm going to do, but chances are I probably won't do anything depending on what they suggest. Um but I'd like to know why, you know, what makes the ferritin levels high? Why am I storing that iron? I don't know. So it'll be interesting to find out. So I will listen to what they have to say, and then I'll probably do my own thing. Is that something that's helped by donating blood or? I mean, possibly um, it's just um, possibly. Uh, um, but I will only donate blood. I won't donate blood on the National Health Service. I will probably look for a private phlebotom phlebotomist who will take the blood um, privately because my trust in the NHS since COVID has, it wasn't very good. It wasn't very high before, but it's just fallen through the floor now. So I don't want to go anywhere near anything like that, mm. which is sad to say i'm sure it's very different than how we do it over here through <laughs> yeah but it's all it's all government run and okay. uh, uh yeah we i mean the brits are known for their love of the national health service and you know compared to the struggles that our american friends go through with their insurance etc it's not such a bad bad system. However, however, it is not run efficiently. It's a massive behemoth. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't call it corporation because kind of it kind of is it run. Is a corporation. It, it is, is a corporation. corporation. Um and it's not run efficiently. So it can drive you crazy. Um, but then again, like any government body. <laughs> They, they're just so inefficient. I worked in the I worked in the uh, school, public school. You 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 call them Maggie, but the state school system, um, um, Jackie for for many years. I know how inefficient the schools never have enough money. 
but how inefficiently they were run, um, it just drives you crazy, but there's nothing you can do. Anyway, uh, let's change the topic to exercise. Now, Maggie was <laughs> emphasizing all the strength training, et cetera. So um, do you do any kind of physical activity, Jackie? Me? Um, I'm not in a good place at the moment when it comes to exercise just because I have been so busy. Um, so that sort of, I haven't got time, I haven't got time, I haven't got time. Um, I'm more wanting to prioritise sleep. Um, but usually, so in an usual week, I would go to Taekwondo three times a week, so three hours a week. Um, I do two lots of strength training, which I haven't done, and I will try and get in some walks, which yeah, none of it I've done recently. And then do open water swimming. So I used used to go once a week, but again, I haven't been recently. Um, my sleep has been very up and down. So getting up at the weekend has been a struggle. And so all those things sort of go out the window when when you're trying to prioritize sleep and not get up too early and things like that. So yeah, I need to get back to it. Yeah, because actually there's a huge impact on your sleep. If you exercise, it's really, really helpful. I know, I know. It's just work. It's just work. I um I have a job, I yeah, have a business and I run a podcast and it's just been taking up. I've been launching a new um group and it's just nice. taking up a lot of time. Yeah. And you're and I study working well. on the uh the trainer, you're becoming a personal trainer. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna say <laughs> studying as well. So, um, I think you're you're downplaying, uh, you know, the effectiveness of that open uh, water swimming and the taekwondo. I mean, I've seen your photos, Jackie. I couldn't do any of that. So, um, perhaps you know, we don't need to go to the gym every single day. It's uh, yeah. you know, so I wouldn't go every day. I'm, of... I'm one of those people that Maggie said that hates it. I really do hate it, but I do oh. do it. <laughs> And I have to push myself every time. Yeah, I can relate to that because uh, 20 years ago, I think, maybe uh, 15 years ago, I thought I would motivate myself if I bought a, an annual membership. And I signed a contract <laughs> at one of Britain's most expensive gyms. And oh, I, no. I could barely <laughs> afford the monthly fee. But I convinced myself that if I were paying for it, I would go. And yeah. of course, I didn't. After a few times, I didn't go and I begged them to reconsider their contract. They said, no, you've signed. And I <laughs> hated paying every single month for something that I I didn't use for a service that I didn't use. So, um, well, fortunately, life has changed different now when I, I, I do go to the gym. I mean, even if it's just for basic exercises like to it. For the blood flow so even the walk to the gym walk and back oh. even if i do that that's still something it doesn't have to be heavy strenuous physical no. exercises for me but but i push myself i have to push myself and if my husband doesn't push then uh you know i would go less i think but he does push me so we go together <laughs> so i'm grateful for that's that that's good yeah yeah so um you've uh you often change your diet, Jackie. You switch between, you know, carnivore and high fat keto and then low carb. And then you have some weekends when life happens, as we like to say. And then you have, you enjoy your carbohydrates or dessert or cake, whatever it is. And then you get yep. back into, into, I don't know, carnivore, whatever it may be. And I think that's pretty normal. It's like we don't necessarily have to be rigid and stuck into the same way of eating for the rest of our life unless of course you're diabetic and then you know your blood yeah. sugar is gonna suffer <laughs> so yep. you don't think twice it makes you think twice actually and okay i go some now is it worth it is it gonna be worth it because for the next 48 hours i'm so like my cgm that is just say i'm wearing now is just gonna beep constantly it's probably just not worth it because it wakes me up it wakes the family up oh gosh <laughs> you, know, you know what it's just not worth it yeah but tell us about so i'd like to talk to both of you about your current diet 
Maggie, do you want to go first? <laughs> oh, okay. Um, so I'm pretty much uh, consider myself low carb, but not uh, extremely low carb. I do eat like a serving of carbs with dinner. Um, but I, you know, the more I learned, you know, and I was guilty of telling people to eat the six small meals, you know, three meals and three snacks. Um, but I, as I learned more and I did the uh, primal health coaching uh, curriculum probably about four or five years ago. And, you know, I, I, so I cut out like the toast with breakfast and the sandwiches at lunch and, and I felt a lot better, but I still do have like a serving of carbs at dinner, usually just like the small potato or sweet potato, some, maybe some rice, something like that. But um, I do better not eating wheat. And every once in a while, I, you know, uh, go off the wagon and have something. But um, I notice I get more stiffness if I eat wheat. So um, I do better if I avoid it. But yeah, mostly I would say low carb. I did also do the, the keto certificate that the primal coaching um just came out with so the month of march i did finally try the ketogenic diet <laughs> finally but um you know and i've been pretty fat adapted for a while so i didn't really notice a lot of difference um and i tried to stick to about 20 to 30 uh, grams of carbs a day but by the by the end of the month I was kind of craving like some toast <laughs> and I, was, I went off it a day early because it was Easter was the last day of March and I ate a little chocolate and stuff but um, so mostly low carb but my main focus is that I really like people to recognize what is real food and I don't eat stuff with like artificial flavors and colors and a lot of weird ingredients like I like to eat food that's real food that's where I am and Maggie you don't have as far as I know um you don't have um any sort of medical conditions so your body's probably able to metabolize that potato that you eat and there's absolutely nothing yeah. wrong with that yeah, yeah I, no, I don't have any. Um, I have a history of asthma. The only, um, I'm not on any medications like daily. The only medication I do get once a year, I get an inhaler so that I have one that's not expired. And once in a blue moon, I need it like if there's really heavy um, pine pollen or ragweed pollen, or if I do get some kind of respiratory issue, but I don't have any um but it, that's improved like dramatically from years ago when i used to actually have daily as to have to use it like real regularly so um that's really the only medical condition that i have and um yeah i think i do okay with a few carbs and it's very confusing you know the uh as much as we interview everybody and you know like i interview a carnivore and i go maybe i should really try that and then the next week i interview somebody that says well the carbs really keep my hormones <laughs> and i sleep better and so anyway i'm not changing anything at the moment but i am curious on about how i would feel on the carnivore diet, I might eventually do like a one month experiment because it was interesting trying the ketogenic diet. I didn't feel like I could give other people that advice if I hadn't actually tried it. Maggie, what, uh, what, so what, uh, so uh, do you, do you remember or do you know the details of the ketogenic diet? Were you counting your macros? Like how much fat to protein ratio was there in it or fat to carb? I just uh, took out you know, high fat? all the carbs. Um, I eat just the fat that's in the meat. I like butter. I, so if I eat vegetables, I put, you know, butter on it. Um, I think I was adding a little MCT oil and heavy cream to my coffee. So I was not actually counting the macros. I just took out that serving of carbohydrates so that I knew that I was staying probably around 20 grams, somewhere around there. Mm -hmm. And I did try measuring my ketones different ways and um, I wasn't super successful. I had all three. I had a, like a breath meter 
that I had bought on eBay and it, I don't think it was really a very good quality one. Yeah. <laughs> wasn't too, and then I had the the urine strips and they never read keto and then I had the the keto mojo and so I would occasionally get over the 0.5 but I wasn't always in ketosis and I um yeah I'm so I'm not sure if, if I added more fat possibly, maybe, I don't know. Uh, but it was an interesting experiment and I feel like I could at least um, advise somebody on how to do it. I, I mainly did it by keeping those carbs low and mm -hmm. eating other whole foods. Mm -hmm. Jackie, your adventures with diet. <laughs> <laughs> As you said, I am always changing around, chopping and changing. I would describe myself at the moment as mostly carnivore. Um, so when I'm at home, that's mostly what I do. I have in the last 10 days reintroduced. I would say I'm mostly, I was mostly carnivore except for my tea. Um, so I drink tea and coffee, um, just usually one coffee a day in the morning. Um, in the last 10 days, I've introduced 85% um, chocolate back in. Um, just find I feel happier with it. I don't know. I don't know what that's about. Um, some days I'll have one square um, and some days I'll have two. Some days I won't have any. Uh, just depends what's going on and how I feel. Uh, usually one square after lunch and one square after supper or one of those. However, there are times, as in this weekend just gone, when I was away, I was at a taekwondo camp, there I would be, I would have a breakfast. So we get up, we go to the beach to train. Um, it's eight o'clock in the morning and we come back around 10, 10 30, and I'd eat then, which I'd have egg and bacon. Um, and then I wouldn't eat until the evening. But um, on two, no, both th the three nights I was away, I had what I would consider a high carb meal. So the first night I had went, took my son out and we had Chinese. The second night I had British fish and chips. And the third night I had a burger and I had the bun and the chips, French fries um, and a dessert. So I don't worry about it because get back on Sunday night yesterday straight back to it and i i do it so what i say is the down there's the people talk about moderator and abstainer from um gretchen rubin's definition and there are those that have to abstain and there are those that can moderate and i always say the the good thing about being a moderator is that you can moderate and the downside of being a moderator is that you can moderate and the good thing about being an abstainer is you have to abstain. And the downside is you have to abstain. So wherever you are, and there are both good things about it and bad things about it. And so mm -hmm. being a moderator, I find that I can switch and change. And therefore I do. And I think if I would be consistent on my journey and stay doing what I'm doing for longer periods of time, I might lose some of the excess weight that I still carry. Um, mm. but at the same time, I'm I'm four stone lighter than when I started. I'm three stone yeah. lighter than what I expected when I started. And so I don't worry about it because I just figure I'm in a good place. I'm healthy. I don't take any medication. I don't need anything. I can sit down on the floor with my hands on my head and stand up with my hands on my head. I can walk upstairs. I don't get pains. I, you know, all these things that I, I couldn't do before. I used to heave myself up the stairs. Mm. If I got down on the floor, I could not get up without leaning on some piece of furniture. So I just think, you know, I'm in a good place. I don't worry about it too much. And, and I can get back to it. You know, I don't need anyone to tell me to get back to it. I just say, you know, I knew before I went away, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, back to it. And that's and that's how I roll, really. And I, for me, it makes it sustainable. It makes it it makes it all the 
hard work on the times when I'm on plan. And I still do find it a challenge sometimes. No, mostly I don't. When I'm at home, it's not a challenge. We mostly only have meat in the fridge. Uh, my son has vegetables with it. There's My husband, there's all, there is all rubbish in the cupboards. But I actually don't see the rubbish. I don't, I don't look for the rubbish. I know it's there, but I just don't go looking for it. I might go to the fridge and, and if I feel like something, I might have a piece of cheese, but I don't go hunting for biscuits they, that, you know, I could find loads of things that are really high carb. They don't bother me anymore. I don't really need them. But if I'm not at home, then I'm more likely to eat off plan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that feeling of, you know, guilt, guilt is, is you know, it, it, it's destructive. It's destructive when people feel guilty because they had a day off their plan or something, you know, it's kind of, it's not a plan really, as you put it, it's, it's a way of life. And, yeah. you know, if you eat something different, it's not going to kill you. You just, uh, you know, you get back, there's a, a new day that you can uh, start your whatever uh, way uh, you want to eat. And and the caveat to that is you have to know yourself and you have to know that you can get back to it because if eating that thing off, in inverted commas off plan, if you eat, um, if you're eating that, you know, maybe it's the slice of toast or the jacket potato, whatever that is, if that's going to send you spiraling into a downward spiral out of control then you can't have it you know but I know I can because I can do one meal I can do one day I can do three days I can go on holiday for two weeks and know that when I come back I'm back on plan and I still don't go mad when I'm on holiday you know some of my meals will still be low carb very low carb keep carnivore things um and I might have the odd meal, I might have the odd um, French fries, I might have a dessert, but I might not have a dessert every day. So I know it's I, it doesn't send me spiralling out of control. And I think you have to know yourself whether you're going to lose control or not. Yeah, that's a and very if you good are, point. And very if you are, you either need someone to hold you accountable to get back on yeah. or... Um, or don't do it yeah that's a very important point and i think this is why it's very important with it that we discuss carb addictions and i know in the uk dr jen unwin now is uh involved in getting it recognized uh internationally as a recognizable addiction I think mm -hmm. it's important because a lot of people cannot do this moderation thing a lot of people will right. uh be triggered by anything that even remotely like berries really mm -hmm. when I heard that for the first time I just couldn't believe it like berries are not even that sweet uh, you know especially the organically grown <laughs> uh, the strawberries you know how can someone be triggered by that that's that's that person needs um, a community that can support them and a professional that can work with them and that person should probably abstain as you put it because they're going to be triggered and then that's it that for months they won't be able to get back on plan um let's talk about your experiences with um with your podcast so when did you start um maggie when did you start your um off of the couch podcast and you're on which platforms are you on so tell us about your podcast Okay, I uh, I was I had just begun my health coaching business, and I I think I listened to a little workshop online about why you had to uh, have a podcast, and I really liked it. And then, of course, the person was trying to sell her podcast mm -hmm. school program, which I didn't buy, but I just went ahead and started my podcast anyway. And I started with the uh, Anchor, which was a little app at the time, and it's since been bought out by Spotify. So I started uh, January of 2022. 
so I'm just over two years and about a hundred episodes. And uh, and when I started, I just I just recorded on like a conference call line. I just did it over the phone. I was too, uh, I think, shy to zoom and see people in person. <laughs> I just recorded over the phone, but um, now I use Zoom. It's it's nice to see the people in person and talk, but I'm also a little more confident, I think. But um, yeah, I had just listened to this little workshop, and so I jumped in and I put my um, coaching business on hold because at the time, uh, my mother was still alive. She was uh, 92 and had had some falls and the yeah you know um we were nearing the end and you know she lived a good long life and and uh it really you know went fairly smoothly most of the time but you know i needed to help her for a while so i put the coaching on hold but i kept up with the podcast and um and it's just so rewarding you know it's just i live in a very small town in new england and um, even to get to Boston is a couple hours away, you know, so um, to have met so many people in the community has been really great, so. Jackie? Fabulous. Um, so I, I knew I wanted to do a podcast all in 2018, 2000, yeah, 2018, and I started talking about it with Louise in early 2019. And we went to the public health collaboration in 2019. So that was five years ago. And Louise said, you need to get these people to come on the podcast. So I collected emails. I started, I did do some interviews. And then I had this thought that I'm going to ask Louise. Now this, now this is a year has passed. Ask Louise if she wanted to come on the podcast with me because she'd been helping me in the background. And she said, yes. She said, but I can't do anything until after July because I've got loads of work so I said okay we'll wait so we waited and eventually and we were just trying to make it too perfect I think in a way we didn't get going until October 2020 so um, the first even you're listening to the podcast some of the episodes at the beginning in the sequence are um, just me interviewing and that's because I'd recorded them before Louise said yes she'll do it with me um and so they were recorded in 2019 so we've been doing well louise has left now but um so i've been doing it for three and a half years we're coming up to episode 200 I do it every week just once a week i don't know how casey does it three times a week i don't uh, know either it is it is hard work it's a lot of work because you have to it's not just recording which i love doing the recordings because you get to talk to people you get to yeah. see people that you wouldn't otherwise meet i've made some really great friends um i've made friends from the people that have come on as guests i've made friends from people that are listeners and they join my facebook group and then we chat and then we might see each other at a conference, you know, the PHC conference every year. People say, oh, you're Jackie. I and once I was I was talking and somebody behind me said, I recognize that voice. <laughs> I met you at the PHC conference. That's right. Um, and I met Joanne at the PHC conference who introduced us. Um, no, I didn't. I I'm, take that back. I met Joanne through doing the podcast. Um, so I just love the you know the people that i meet i love the stories i hear i yeah. really enjoy the stories of just everyday people who something happened and they changed their life you know i remember i've got one episode with um a lady and she was introduced to me by someone else and she changed her life because she hit her leg on a table so the podcast the episode is called a table changed my life um so I just love those stories and I love talking to people and I love hearing all, you know, we all have a common thread in that we've changed our diet and lifestyle, but we all got there through different avenues, different reasons, different things bring us to it. We've changed along the way. So all our, our lives are totally different. Yeah. 
Isn't that interesting? Um, yeah, I, I I love the episodes too. I love recording. I absolutely love recording, but it, it actually can turn. It can easily turn um, into a full time job. Easily, oh. easily. Um, if, if, if you don't so moderate it <laughs> using the same words, you know, diet moderation. If if I don't moderate my times when I'm recording and when I'm posting the videos, um, uh, it I I could could do it every single day of the week, um, and turn it into a full time job, which obviously I I can't because I have other commitments too. But I absolutely, just like you said, Jackie, I enjoy meeting people, talking to them, learning from them, because you learn so much from the people that you interview. And even people who are not necessarily an MD or a, or a dietitian or a nutritionist, just regular people who have a success story to share. You learn from, I, I actually, I get so much inspiration from people like that. Yeah, absolutely. You know Maggie? Oh, definitely. And I think that's what most of mine are. I have interviewed a few doctors and uh, professionals, but most, mostly I have, most of the people I have interviewed are people that have had a transformation story themselves and then now they're going into some kind of a business or at least um, trying to get their message out in some way, you know, because they're just want to share, you know, not, it's not even for like a financial reason. It's just because they want to share that with other people and, you know, good health and turn their life around. You know, it's very inspiring. Very inspiring. And, and thank you to both of you for actually um, interviewing me about type 1 diabetes. Um, so well, I really enjoyed coming on your podcast. But um, Maggie, you said something earlier, and I absolutely related to that because uh, I also hated putting my face on on this, and and mine isn't mine. Actually, is on YouTube, right? Yeah, you're on YouTube. Yeah, right good from for the you. Beginning, and I hated doing that. I just very reluctantly, because um, when my book was nearly ready, my friends were cheering cheering me on, and they said, "Okay, now you need uh, some kind of an, um, a social media platform." to promote the book before yeah. you know, you send it for publishing, et cetera. And I couldn't agree more because I, I have a translation agency. So I'm kind of familiar. I know that you need a place where you can start talking about your book. And, and you know, they suggested a Facebook page, Facebook group, and I just kept putting it off until one of them actually created a group. He said, that's it, that's your group here. Now manage it. He created it for me, one of my friends. And the and 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 the YouTube started just like that because uh, because I'd already done some interviews with the people that I invited to my channel. I was interviewing them as part of my research for the book. So I'd already spoken okay. to yep. Dr. Tro. I'd already yeah. spoken to Philip Ovedia. I'd spoken to Graham Phillips from the pharmacist from uh, from the yeah. UK. Um, and a few others. So I was already familiar with them. I had their contact details. They were supporting me. They had collected quotes from them, et cetera, for the book. So I just sent a quick email saying, you know, what if I start a, you know, I'm thinking of starting a YouTube channel. Would you be my guest? And they were all happy. And I couldn't believe it. They said, yes, when? And I thought, oh my goodness, I really need to book these people. So this is how it started. But I just dreaded the idea of putting my face out there. And you get used to it though. You, you get used to it, right? And it becomes yeah. less intimidating and you gain confidence. And I, it, it's kind of a privilege, right? To talk to so many people. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's an honor. It really is. It, it really is. It really is. I think, you know, I really appreciate everyone who gives, gives me their time. They don't yeah, have to. You have a pretty impressive list. I uh, I think you had reached out to me and I looked at who you had interviewed and I was very impressed. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, right. So uh, what advice would you give to uh, someone, um, Jackie, who's thinking of starting a podcast? Actually, give the advice to me. Now, I'm on YouTube. I'm not on Spotify or any other like Apple podcast or anything. So what's the advice? 
<laughs> I didn't think of that, but I was going to get you to give advice to someone who's starting from scratch. But if I came to you and I said, Jackie, what do you suggest that I do? And Maggie, just, you know, for you as well. So what do you think I could do next? So you, you're only on YouTube yeah. and you don't, I'm and you don't do any on audience. YouTube, but I oh, it's really a lot of really things from listeners. They say, you need to go on a podcast as well, because, you know, people obviously listen to podcasts as they're driving, et cetera. YouTube isn't always so easy. Yeah. I don't like YouTube you just go. for that reason, because I like to listen. I yeah. can listen while I'm putting the washing in the washing machine. I can, while I'm doing the washing up, when I'm driving, when I'm brushing my teeth, I just listen all the time. I hate uh, if, and then while I'm listening, if I think, oh, I need to make a note to do that on my phone, I can do it. I don't have to come out and go back in and come out and go back in. So I hate YouTube um, and I don't go on there very often unless somebody sends me something that I absolutely have to do. So I get that it's, but for you, it's going to be so easy, so easy. Yeah. You take the audio version of your zoom zoom recording mm -hmm. yeah and you get a host and you upload it yeah that's it you can do actually... an in if you do an intro if you want to do an intro do an intro yeah you could actually you uh use spotify for podcasters it doesn't cost anything now um to host you could just take your audio recording from the zoom and um it it's very easy Post it. <laughs> I'll be happy to <laughs> tell you offline if you need any, you know, advice on how to do it. It's it yeah. is really easy now. You can just take a the audio recording from Zoom and and uh, I edit mine on my phone. I get the little strip and I it, it's really pretty simple. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, mine is fully edited, um, and I will quite often stop in the middle and. Or, you know, if the guest says something or forgets something, that all gets cut out. You know, you hear some podcasts and they say, oh, yes, we'll cut this out. But they haven't. <laughs> oh, they don't. That somebody's yeah. coughing or sneezing. Or <laughs> they, yeah. They say, so we'll edit gets... that out. And then they don't. <laughs> yeah, we'll edit that out. You know, I'm just going to the toilet. I'll be back in a minute. <laughs> um, we'll cut that out. And then they don't. <laughs> you heard everything that's gone on. That's so <laughs> all those people. That's there's so people that, and but there's people that are unapologetic and they just say i'm yeah. not cutting it out and yeah. one i listen to and he'll go off for two minutes and then come back and you're sitting there <laughs> listening to nothing for two minutes <laughs> while he's gone to feed his dog or go to the <laughs> toilet or make a cup of now coffee. that i would cut out yeah it's not that hard but, but he, sometimes you know, it's funny you know like oh the neighbor's doing the leaf blowing or or the dog's barking at the ups man i mean that's just part of podcasting it's not a big deal or the Probably on YouTube, the child walks by and <laughs> that's yeah. right. we're all used to uh, it these days. Yeah. I don't worry about that so much. I did in the beginning. I used to cut everything out, but yeah. I used to cut out all the ums and the ahs and mostly I leave them now. But sometimes it'll be me stopping and saying, oh, what should we talk about next? And you don't hear that when you're listening to the podcast because that all disappears. Um, so... And there's there's a little secret to to anybody that's listening how my podcasts end up like that because I stop and I'll ask and we'll discuss something and we'll go off topic and we'll talk yeah. about something and then we'll come back on air again. So um, you don't see all that in the final version. But if you're doing, you probably don't do much editing here. I do, I do. Yeah, I do. Oh, you do? Yeah. Okay. So, you know, not every detail, not every, because, because some of it is very kind of organic, very raw and it's, it's, it actually adds flavor. Um, yeah. I, but, I leave a lot in now. I do yeah. leave a lot in. But I still um, do some editing. Um, yeah. Especially my ums. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it would be exactly the same and editing it. I mean, Maggie's doing it on a phone. I don't. I use Audacity, and I just yeah, Audacity cut good it out. Too. And I have, I have, a, I have help to do it as well. So I have a an assistant who does the first lot of editing, and then I go through it and I do the second lot and catch the bits that she's missed that, <clears throat> or where they've got knocked the mic or something. Or I'll catch those that she's hasn't caught. Um, 
so yeah it's, it's still a lot of work it's still a lot of work and i mine is uploaded to my website and so it goes out from there and it's on all the platforms that's right um so uh, I, um, I i need to do i need to do the uh i need to do the audio as well the podcasts um now you're making it up as if it's very very easy i really need to look into that but uh, video is much harder video is much videos. harder yeah, it is much harder. But uh, you see, I love watching people. If I'm listening to something on Spotify, the first thing I do is, is there a YouTube version for it? Do you know why I love the YouTube? Because I can see people. I can, I can, I, I love seeing people. And I think I get yeah. more meaning or messages or nuance from people's expressions and the way they're saying something rather than just hearing the audio. Um, so that this is what I love. I personally love YouTube, um, not being necessarily a host on YouTube, but I love watching through YouTube rather than hearing the podcast. So, so everything I see on Spotify, I try and find the YouTube version. Most of them have actually. Yeah. Most, and and now you can Most actually have the video right on, um, the podcast on Spotify too. Like Spotify, you can just do right. the video, but I, I'm like with Jackie, I listen, I listen when I drive, I listen, walking the dog. I listen when I'm putting the laundry in. I, you know, it's, um, yeah, it's very convenient. I'm more of a listener. Yeah. Uh, and I think for me it's because I just started with podcasts. I, I never really, it's... and, and the other thing is growing up, my parents never watched TV so I don't watch TV. So watching is not something that comes easy to me. I'm just not a watcher. So I've never grown up watching anything. So it, I guess that's why listening has become really easy. And somebody got me into podcasts and there I am. Yeah, I haven't Which had is... TV actually for 15 years. So so YouTube TV is what I do. I watch well, not YouTube TV, but I love it. So when I'm cooking, I put put YouTube oh, on a large screen yeah. and I like seeing the faces as I'm cooking. So quite often I go back and I so I didn't quite catch that. So let me just watch his face. Was he saying something positive, something negative or whatever? So I, I get lots of cues from, from the faces. Ladies, this was absolutely wonderful. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put all your details in the description below. So for my viewers, please support Maggie's efforts and Jackie's yeah. efforts. Follow them on wherever you um, hear your podcast <laughs> and uh, and support their efforts. We're all we're all doing this for the greater good. That's true, right? Would you agree? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. It's, a hobby. It, it's a hobby. You know, we've all got our own businesses. Um, so Maggie and I are both health coaches, primal health coaches. So we do that as well. And then the podcast is just because, well, for me, is I want to be changing the world one person, one story at a time. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, I feel like if just even, you know, one person hears a story that helps them get started and helps them change their life, and then they're going to help another person. And it, we just need to be this little ripple. I totally agree. Well, once again, thank you both so very much for your time today. Thanks for having us. Thank bye you. Bye. Good to bye. see you. All right. Bye.